First of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we are meeting. It's something that I learned about, picked up from Australia, and I, I believe it's, it's a good idea. I mean, whether those traditional owners in the United States or American Indians in, in Australia, the Aboriginal inhabitants in Japan, it could be the Ainu. Here it could be Picts, but I don't know this area's history, so I will leave it with just the traditional owners. Alito Chikma, Sia Joe Watkins, Sia Chata. My name is Joe Watkins. I'm a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. My uh, family on my father's side are the Willis and the Watkins family. On my mother's side, they're the Hill and the Flowers. Um, Willis and Watkins, surprisingly enough, are the Choctaw side. Watkins is a Welsh name. I have no idea how we got that name being from Mississippi and Alabama in the United States. My mother is part French, or was part French, part Irish. Uh, American mongrel is what we call her. Surprisingly enough, the, the family names that sound as if they are Indian, you know, hills and flowers, are non-Indian. The others that sounds very established, as I say, Welch and Willis are the Indian side of the family. So there you go. Today, what I'm going to talk about is communicating with community, adapting communication styles to the community. As archaeologists, we are often called upon to discuss our work with groups that share our interest in the human past, to communicate with those whose heritage we study, or to explain our findings to other stakeholders. As communicators, however, um, we often bore them with jargon, dazzle them with brilliance, or lose their attention altogether. And even when we do not confuse them with acronyms, we take it for granted that the words we choose are understood in our intended manner. Archaeologists are also generally unaware that people communicate at different levels, depending on cultural preference and interpersonal relationships. Imagine, if you will, walking into a classroom, sitting down with paper and pencil, and waiting for the professor to begin. After a few hesitant noises, the professor speaks, but in a language mostly incomprehensible to you. You understand the words and you get the gist of the lecture, but somehow the real meaning of the lecture does not come through. You speak to the professor after the lecture and are immediately struck by the difference between the professor as a lecturer and the professor as a person. When asked why the lecture was unintelligible, the professor merely states, it was intended to be understood only by those who already understand what I'm saying. If I have to explain it, you don't need to know it. <clears throat> of course, such an event is not likely to occur, or at least we're not likely to admit to doing such a thing. But when we fail to communicate our ideas in clear, commonly understood language, we run the risk of negatively impacting the public, sometimes even beyond our own comprehension. <clears throat> Culture influences what we hear, what we say, how we hear things, and how we say things. But most of all, it inf influences how we interpret things. In looking at the ways we communicate with non-anthropologists, perhaps we should take some lessons from theories that relate to intercultural communications. Edward T. Hall differentiated between low and high context communication as a means of explaining cultural differences in the way things are presented and accepted by human populations. While these are arguably generalizations, height context communication occurs when most of the information is either in the physical context or internalized in the person, while very little is in the coded, explicit, transmitted part of the message. Low-context communication, on the other hand, occurs when the mass of information is vested in the explicit code. Like this is a very low-context communication style in that we explain what we think we are saying because we don't share a great deal of common background that allows us to 
understand just minor uh, inflections. <clears throat> Some examples. High context and low context communication is used in all cultures, but one form tends to predominate. If you look to these slides, you can see the comparison with high context and low context. Um, as archaeologists, we have a great deal of high context information when we talk about, say, stratigraphy or superposition. But when we start talking about, say, the archaic of eastern United States, then we start talking within low context sessions or sections, understanding that you may not have the same understanding of what it means to talk about eastern United States archaic cultures as you might have if we're talking about contemporary culture, for example. In looking at general ideas about how different cultures, uh, different countries operate, <clears throat> there is a general tendency by a, a, a country to operate within different levels of these contexts, high context and low context. In this example, you can see that the Swiss have a tendency to operate on the most lower context. Everything is very explicit. Everything is pretty much explained. There is a general idea that no one shares the same level of understanding without being very open about it. Whereas on the other end of the scale, Asian cultures operate within a very high context understanding. A great deal is within personal presentation. It is taken for granted that a particular action is, is certainly understood much more easily. At the same time that cultures operate within an area of high context, low context, cultures also operate within a, a manner of directness. The, the way you interact with individuals, whether you speak directly, I don't like that shirt, or whether you operate within an indirect uh, style of communication, are you really going to wear that shirt? So that there's a very subtle dis, distance, uh, excuse me, a very subtle difference, but the reality is that as we communicate with others, these uncoded, underlying meanings truly influence how we communicate or how well we communicate. Again, communication styles, indirect communication styles, very implicit, uh, expecting more delayed results. We'll talk now and maybe a week or two down the line we will finish off what it is we're trying to accomplish. Whereas if you look at direct communication, it's very explicit. I don't like what you're doing. We need to make a decision right now. Do you understand exactly what I'm saying? Surprisingly enough, as we interact with different cultures, we often fail to take into consideration the levels at which these cultures operate. <clears throat> Again, some examples of statement styles, indirect and direct statement styles. Do you think that's a good idea? I don't like that idea. Um, have you tried doing it this way? You're doing that wrong. So as we start learning how different cultures with which we are operating communicate or prefer to communicate, as we modify our communication styles, it makes it much easier to come to an understanding with the groups with which we are operating. In the United States, American Indian tribes are very much indirect communicators, very much high context. And so when they operate with government agencies who are very much at the opposite end of the scale, it creates an issue of understanding. And it very often creates people walk out of the room thinking, well, that was a great consultation, or those people had no idea what they were doing. <clears throat> Again, this is just a graphic example of how these two areas of communication interrelate with high context and indirect communication styles and low context and direct, direct communication styles. 
Um, surprisingly enough, this book, Culture Matters, the Peace Corps Cross-Cultural Workbook, has a great utility for helping you understand how these communication styles differ. When I was working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the United States government 20 years ago, all these things sort of tumbled together. I recognize that there are different ways that tribal people approached consultation and approached working with the federal government and really had no understanding that Edward Hall had discovered this 30 years previously. So I stumbled upon this and then started talking about it and realized that, yes, there is this entire branch of, of com communication that dealt with this rather heavily. And so I found this. You can get this online. It's hard to find as a paper copy. But this um, website, you can get it and download it. If you deal with different cultures, it's very much worth your while to look at it to work through the exercises. Another useful reference is this toolkit for cross-cultural communication. Uh, it was developed as a result of a study of collaboration styles, primarily among American uh, ethnic groups. <clears throat> it looks at the communication styles of African American, Asian American, Native American, Hispanic American, and Anglo American communities, all these hyphenated American communities. Uh, the study noted that great differences separated each minority and the community from the Anglo American communities, with the differences created by variations in expectations, styles, assumptions, values, body language, and so forth. For example, in one of these slides you can look at in terms of animated or emotional gestures. Asians and Native Americans generally operate at a lower end of the scale. They very rarely demonstrate very emotionally in public, whereas African Americans demonstrate very much in public. They're very animated. Um, and so by looking at this, it gives you, again, another understanding about how these different cultural communities take on characteristics that can be used to help define how you would best interact with them, especially if you're looking at concern with clock time. As a federal agencies always have a concern with clock time. You know, we need to meet at 10 o'clock. We need to be finished by 10.30. We have to have this project done within a week. Within 30 days, you have to respond to this letter. Whereas Native Americans and Hispanic communities, generally it's manana. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. Tomorrow is fine. We'll meet in the morning. And it, we'll meet at 10, but that could be 10 after 10, or 10 minutes late, or 10 minutes till 11. So. There's not a great deal of concern with, there is a concern with punctuality, but not a concern with what it says on a watch face. So if you can get a hold of this kind of idea, it helps in the way not only you communicate your data to a group, but also how you develop interpersonal relationships with people that help get your research out there to have it make a meaning to the community with which you're working. <clears throat> so how can such differences in styles of communication affect archaeology? Well, if minorities withdraw from participation in services designed on an Anglo-American model, it should not be much of a surprise that Native American and Anglo-American groups have such differing views of the consultation process or of the education process, as it were. Anglo-American individuals familiar with working with low context communication styles with explicit direct communication are hard pressed to understand the high context indirect communication styles of Native American participants. 
Anglo-Americans generally want immediate answers, uh, while Native Americans more often will take their time to find solutions. Anglo-Americans generally desire specific responses, while Native Americans are more often use indirect responses to state a position. These culturally influenced communication styles, if not taken into consideration, are likely to prevent meaningful discussion and mutually beneficial solutions from being reached. Few of us are taught these ideas or concepts in graduate school, or even in our struggles to become good instructors and academicians. We learn to communicate in a manner similar to that in which we are instructed and forced to read. The low context, direct, repetitive, oversighted, and explicit style found in most academic classrooms, professional presentations, and tenure-earning publications. <clears throat> Look at the following fictional paragraph, if you will. The initial examination of the material culture was purposefully delayed until it was feasible to record the material with an appropriate medium. Upon resumption of the investigations, it was determined that the artificial assemblage, or the artifactual assemblage, was indicative of a pre-ceramic material culture that resided within certain topographical restrictions and, in conjunction with the readily provable laws of superposition, it was determined that the depositional sequence was consistent with the chronological sequencing we had expected to encounter. Translated, it says, uh, we waited until it was light enough to take pictures, archaic period artifacts were associated with particular landforms, and the stratigraphy was normal and not reversed. Which sounds more scientific? The first, of course. But it takes 75 words to say what could be said in 27 words, and maybe, maybe even 24, or maybe even less than that. There are certain concepts that require us to use scientific phrases to describe, and we should be careful about dumbing down too much. But we also need to speak to the public on a level easily understood. We pride ourselves on our ability to scientifically present data but we all too often lose our audience within the first page. Are we doing a service if the people who pay for our research are not interested in what we have to say? There are concrete consequences when we are unable to communicate our intentions and abilities to the public. We constantly decry the illegal excavation of, of archaeological sites, likening the destruction to grave robbing, to us, scientific excavation carries with it the concept of a noble pursuit at gaining knowledge. To many American Indian tribal groups, however, it makes no difference whether the disturbance is caused by looters or by qualified archaeologists. As Devin Mahusala has written, the only difference between an illegal ransacking of a burial ground and a scientific one is the time element, sunscreen, little whisk brooms, and the neatness of the area when finished. If we fail to communicate our findings to the public in words that everyone can understand, we may be something much better than a grave robber, but who will know it? And as we deal with some of our other publics, we have to take into consideration that we fail miserably in truly communicating what we find out. For, as the end of this quote says, most of the results of archaeological research appear as unpublished contract reports written in an oppressively technical jargon that the public cannot decipher. The written word is perhaps our most potent weapon in the battle to protect our cultural heritage, and yet we are very poorly uh, prepared to communicate ideas. The health and perhaps survival of our discipline depends on our ability to better communicate. Thank you.